So yeah, so my name is Jason Jeffries. I'm a senior scientist at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory uh, in Livermore, California. I started doing diamond cell work. This is very loud. I see yeah, why I don't have problems with it. Um, I started doing diamond cell work probably about 20 years ago or something like that. So I've been working on a lot of things. Adam's talk was great this morning to know about all the tricks of the trade. It's not even close to the whole, the whole deal. Like most experiments, there's a lot of work that goes into that. Um, and you got to hear from Bianca the challenges of neutrons and then Stan the challenges of magnetic fields. And so what I want to talk about a little bit is the other, the other tool that gets used a lot in high pressure science and that's synchrotrons. Um, from the very beginning of the idea of building new synchrotrons, DAX came right away because they're basically married in size scale. And so DAC people jumped on synchrotrons as soon as they were available. And so I want to talk about what kind of all the tools that you have at your disposal. Uh, darn it. Get right here. Okay. So I mentioned I'm from Livermore, California. Uh, a, a little different in that we are we're part of the DOE laboratories. So similar to Bianca, who was from Oak Ridge. Um, sorry, I messed up. Over here, uh, Livermore, California is over here. It's in the Bay Area of California. Uh, pretty nice weather most of the time, uh, especially when it's winter. We don't have snow, so that's pretty nice. Um, but we are part of uh, 17 Department of Energy Laboratories. We sit over here. We're what's called a multi-purpose national security lab. Uh, Los Alamos, Lawrence Livermore, and San Diego National Laboratories are all born out of the Manhattan Project and our nuclear weapons laboratories. Uh, pretty much everything else in the DOE over here in, in the science part was also born out of the Manhattan Project one way or another. No longer continue necessarily their weapons work entirely, but they do a lot of other uh, multi-purpose science labs, including a lot of the user facilities that we have in the programs. Um, so that's what we are. Uh, we're one of these national labs. There's a lot of people that work in the national lab environment in the United States. So I think there's supposed to be something about jobs later on in the thing. So this is one of the places people go that is not, you know, not academia and not industry. So I wanted to bring that up as an idea. Uh, Livermore itself, this is a picture of Lawrence Livermore. For those of you who've ever been over there, you can tell this was taken in the spring because it's green. Most of the time our grass is brown uh, or it's on fire. One of those two. Um, so this is looking looking west towards the ocean. There's some mountains around. We're actually only one square mile. So we're one of the smallest national labs within the entire complex. Um, I'm not sure how big Oak Ridge is. It's probably more like, you know, 25 square miles or something like that. Uh, Los Alamos, yeah, most of it's forest. Los Alamos is 60 square miles. 
Idaho National Laboratory is like 120, so they get, they get very big. Most of that's empty space in most of them. You can see ours is kind of packed with a lot of stuff here. We do have an experimental site that sits about 11 miles from Tracy, so it's about 20 miles from us or something like that, where we uh, basically blow stuff up out in the hills. Uh, we have almost 9,000 people now at the laboratory within this one square mile. Our budget is about three billion a year. Uh, and we, we generally have kind of all the disciplines of what I would say the sciences and engineering is. So if, you're, if, you, if you go to any sort of grad school in engineering or a science, we probably have a department there on the, at the lab for that. Uh, Adam sort of threatened that someone was gonna throw this slide up. Um, so this is, he kind of mentioned this before, so I won't dwell on it. But the reason we study things as a function of pressure is because it basically dominates how the universe works. Uh, it's a fundamental thermodynamic variable, just like temperature is, uh, and it basically is telling you energy densities. That's what it's measuring at any given time. Um, so there's not as much interesting stuff that's happening up here in the really low pressure phases. I say that because I'm not a UHV scientist. If I was a UHV scientist, I would probably tell you all about how awesome it is to take all the atoms away from someplace. Um, most of the work that we do is more centered over here, and that's the high pressure, high pressure realm. Uh, you can see where we live here in ambient pressure, right in the center of this, this scale bar. A lot of the work that Diamond Anvil cells sort of kind of run in this range up into the 100, the 100 GPA range. You know, now there's things 400, 500 GPA. Uh, but there's still plenty of physics that's happening even at higher pressures and higher temperatures that we're not going to talk about that's not accessible by Diamond Anvil cells. So why do we study things under pressure? I just told you it's fundamentally driving things. But you know this also from all of your basic physics classes or engineering classes or anything. Um, so starting with something as simple as the ideal gas law, it tells you that pressure matters in, in what things, how things work. This is why like a steam engine works or why you can transfer energy in a piston or anything like that. You need to know this sort of thing to make even something that simple, so to speak, work. Um, so we all know that. It gets a lot more complicated as you, as you go to different materials. You can see I have a little kind of plot over here that talks about the compressibility of a gas with pressure. This is basically a vertical line here, which you know because you can blow up a balloon and stuff like that. Uh, you can't really do the same sort of thing if you try and crush that Coke can after you've stepped on it. It's not going to get any smaller. It's largely incompressible at these things. But if you put enough pressure on it, you can get solids to compress as well, which is what we do in the DAC. Um, so it gets a lot more complicated when you have phase transitions, but that's where a lot of interesting physics is happening. A lot of things in terms of how the structure is moving with pressure, then that drives things like your electronic states. So you can drive things like superconductors and magnets to show up under pressure that you don't see. Uh, and then it keeps getting more complicated with things like Stan was talking about with, you know, superhydrides. So now we're talking about not only making phase transitions, we're making new compounds under pressure that we can't access and making new you know, superconducting states that we've never seen before as well. So it gets really exciting. Uh, and if you keep going up and pressure's well beyond the DAC, it just sort of gets you know, ridiculous, kind of makes my you know, neutron stars kind of make my brain, my brain hurt. Um, so the challenge here of what we want to do really in the high pressure community is we want to be able to generate the pressure. So Adam talked a lot about how we do that, the real practical aspects of, of making a DAC work. Um, generally, you want to know what you're looking at. So you want to measure your atomic configurations. This is the same thing if you make a new crystal, you grow something new, you have to go do x-ray diffraction on it to show that you had something. You're not allowed to just put a bunch of junk in a crucible, take a bunch of junk out of the crucible, unless you're making superhydrides. Uh, take a bunch of junk out of the crucible, measure random stuff and say, look, it's a magnet because you, you got to know what you're looking at. So we have to do the same thing under pressure. And don't get me wrong, the superhydride people have to do this too. They just have to do it in a different way. And then generally we want to do something and measure the properties. It's usually not that interesting to just know the crystal structure of something. So knowing its volume is important, but we'd like to know what it does. Is it a, is it a magnet? Is it a metal? Is it a molecule? What is it? So the synchrotron is going to do kind of that, uh, some of that other work that I'm going to talk about. And the first part is then generating pressure. Um, we're talking kind of mostly about diamond cells today. That's what we've been talking about, but it's not the only way to generate pressure. Um, so we're talking here, this is where kind of the, the DAC lives in pressure temperature space. You can see it's pretty big. It actually, over the years, has, has encompassed a very large phase space that we have access to. Um, I would say if you plotted this thing maybe 
uh, five, 10 years ago, it would probably end around here. There were people who made experiments above 100 GPA, but it wasn't routine. Uh, they were kind of, you know, serious efforts, but people routinely now clear 100 GPA and are starting to routinely get up around 400 now. Um, so it's really gone a lot, and this is a log scale. Um, temperature is also, again, if you plotted this 20 years ago, temperature was, you know, uh, what you could put a DAC in a furnace and maybe go to 400 C. But with the advent of laser heating uh, and other things like inductive coils, people have really pushed these up to very high temperatures as well. Uh, the other things on here were mentioned earlier, the clamp cell, the Bridgman cell. Those are all what we call static pressure devices. They basically make a pressure that you hold for whatever time you want. These other things in red are ways that we make pressure and temperature that are dynamic. So these are basically shock physics experiments. They're, they're transient in time to the point of milliseconds or microseconds. Uh, so we have things like gas guns, which is basically shooting a bullet at a wall. Um, pulsed power, which is basically shooting current through a little wire. Uh, and then we have short pulse lasers, which is shooting lasers at a target and blowing stuff up. So there's also high explosives that you can blow stuff up. So all these you can think of is basically blowing stuff up and measuring it. Kind of what Stan was saying, Los Alamos is really good at this because they've been blowing stuff up for almost 100 years now. Uh, so they know how to measure a lot of stuff that's here. Livermore is very good at it too. I would say we're actually a little better at it in some cases, but it depends. So we already talked a lot about the DAC. So I don't really want to go through too much. One of the things I wanted to do about this, though, was show the DAC that we typically use over here uh, at Livermore. We have our own DAC. You may have noticed this, too, that everybody that talks, Stan has 17 DACs for one experiment, right? He's just doing this one thing. You build DACs for how they work. They all kind of work the same way. They're all clamps. They all pressurize things. But exactly how you do that really depends on the experiment. Um, this is something that we use. It's basically like the symmetric DAC that Adam showed, but it uses a gas membrane, which is up here. There's basically a little diaphragm there that fills up with gas, high pressure gas from a gas bottle, and that's what drives the pressure between the piston and the cylinder and basically moves it down. The nice thing about this, instead of screws, is this allows us to move the pressure around while we're in a synchrotron hutch. So that's why we do that. The reason it's full of tape um, is, can anyone guess why it has tape all over it? Go ahead, what do you think? You've got nasty. Yeah, but do you know which one it is? That's beryllium. We're just, we're, we are actually, you see, what Stan said was we might have plutonium or uranium or something terrible. Those are really dangerous, but that has beryllium, which the Department of Energy is terrified of. <laughs> so <laughs> we have a beryllium gasket in there, and I'll talk a little bit about why. But, so we tape it up in case it fractures, it does not get out to the population and, you know, turn everyone into zombies. So, um, same thing is true with, with, with everything. There's nothing special about what we do once we're inside. The heart of it is still two diamonds that are opposed that press against one another. Specimen sizes vary a lot. In general, you can think of things that are kind of 10 microns, which has been mentioned before, as sort of the thickness of a sample. The higher in pressure you want to go, the smaller the sample has to be. It's got to fit in the volume of the cell. And you don't want it, as Adam mentioned, to bridge between the two anvils, because then you come into very non-hydrostatic conditions. And so you tend to make things thinner then. Um, but these are all really determined. This is just kind of a rule of thumb. I think everyone's heard it today, DAC stuff is small. Um, one of the things that Adam mentioned was a lot of people use needles. Uh, one, of my, one of the first tools I ever used for loading my sample in a DAC was my own eyelash. So I had an eyelash, and I put it on a stick. And I kept that stick for like a decade with my eyelash, because if you ever do that and look at your eyelash under a microscope, it'll be like three microns at the tip. It's a very pointy, pointy little thing, and it lasts a long time. So um, I don't encourage people to go pull all their eyelashes out routinely, but you know, if you're ever stuck, you might have the tool right, right on, your, on your face. Um, so, uh, so the rest of the talk, what I really want to talk about really is how you make measurements with the DAC, not how you generate the pressure. There's tons of things you can do with the DAC. There's a lot of optical work, which has been mentioned before, because the diamonds are transparent and you get pretty much any kind of light you want in there. Uh, the gap is, I think, four volts or something like that. So that's the entire visible spectrum will go through the DAC. Um, you can do transport, which was talked about. It's very challenging to do this, uh, but it can be done and it can lead to a lot of, you can learn a lot from doing transport in a DAC, especially when you marry that with some other measurement techniques. Uh, Bianca talked a lot about these cool things with neutrons. These are just, again, if you, if you were to make that plot I made about what, which pressures you're doing, neutrons 10 years ago, 20 years ago, it was like, yeah, it was 0.7 GPA 
or something. So new, neutrons and DACs have just has exploded in the last decade of what we can do. Um, and then there's X-rays. Um, and the nice thing about X-rays really comes from the synchrotron. X-rays were always good in a lab source. They work with diamonds. Um, but the real, the real revolution in, in diamond cell kind of characterization came about with the, with the third generation light sources that we'll talk about. So why, why is that so important? Um, so unlike neutrons, things that are scattering in x-rays go as z squared. So the bigger elements scatter better. So light elements scatter poorly. So X-rays are not really good for looking at, you can kind of think about this if you have a lab X-ray source. You could probably measure alumina. It's probably okay. You can kind of see some of the, the peaks that are there from oxygen. But even aluminum nitride is going to start getting harder. And going down to something like aluminum boride is going to get really difficult to measure. Um, and so low energies can be really, can be kind of difficult. The other problem then in a DAC is that those low energies will get absorbed by the diamond. So it still absorbs X-rays, and that, that absorption is also going as the, uh, as the, Z, as the atomic number. Um, synchrotrons, what they give you, though, is a tunable energy. So you can see here kind of what, what energies you get. This is the photon energy down here. So your typical lab X-ray source will be something like copper, molybdenum, silver. It'll be somewhere in here, something like uh, 8 to 20 kilovolts or something like that. And you can see something like the APS is really kind of starting its, uh, so this is the advanced photon source at Argon. It's really down here kind of starting its sweet spot right around that, right around this 15, 20 kilovolts. And it's still got plenty of photons that are, that are hanging out down here. This is plotting your brightness, basically how many photons you have. Your lab source is down here. That's the other thing that the third generation synchrotrons give you. Uh, tons and tons of photons. Uh, there are lots of measurements that we do that are incredibly photon starved. Things that normally, if you have just a lab source, you would say, we're going to the neutron source to measure this because the neutrons are going to scatter 10,000 times better. The beauty of the synchrotron is you have 10 to the 19 more photons. So you have so many to throw away that you still have a, a lot of signal. Um, right? I mean, these are, these are literally moles of, of photons that are coming out. It's enormous. Um, so. So, so then the next thing that, that comes from the synchrotrons, especially these kind of third generation ones that are out here, is how that interacts with the diamond. What's plotted here is the diamond uh, X-ray attenuation. So this is the transmission of X-rays through the diamond as a function of energy for what I would say is a typical diamond anvil cell diamond. Typical DAC diamonds are something like a third of a carat on average, maybe three millimeters in dimension, kind of in width and height, something like that. Um, so you can see if you're down here at your lab source that's under, under 10 kilovolts, your diamond on the way in, you've got two of them, remember, you've got to go in and you've got to come out. So your first on, you know, trip now, you've, you've attenuated 90% of your beam before you, that's just to get to the sample. Now you're going to attenuate 90% more as it goes out. So you quickly lose a lot of your photons down here at, at most lab sources. Again, if you get up to some of the like silver anodes or moly anodes or something, they'll be here. And so you can start getting some pretty good transmission. Um, but you can also see pretty much everything over 20 kilovolts, the diamond becomes almost X-ray transparent by comparison. So everything up here, pretty much 15 kilovolts and above, is cakewalk for, for experiments. Uh, below 15 and down to about 6 is kind of doable. And things below 6 kilovolts start becoming extraordinarily photon starved because you're attenuating you know, orders of magnitude of the diamonds. Um, so synchrotrons, of course, can generate all of these X-rays. This is sort of the sweet spot of APS, um, but there's still photons way down here. They make all kinds of photons. Um, there's a few different flavors of photons that you get out of there. Um, as I mentioned here, you can go from hundreds of electron volts all the way up to hundreds of kilovolts. Uh, on the synchrotron, uh, 100 kilovolts, if you wanted to have a lab source, is like a uranium anode or something. So as a lab source, that's not something people are really going to work on. Because lab sources are characteristic x-rays. And eventually, you run out of characteristic x-rays. You take a 1s, and you throw it out, and you get an x-ray of uranium, and you're done. That's as high as you go, and that's a little over 100. But uh, synchrotrons can go over that, too. Uh, most work at a synchrotron, I would say, is monochromated in the beam. Uh, so that means, that means you take all of, all of this and you just pick a delta function somewhere and that's the x-ray. Those are the x-rays you're going to take out of there. Um, and so when you're monochromated, sort of, this is maybe, 
an idea of the sort of the flux that you get, 10 to the 8 to 10 to the 12. Some beam lines are a little more, a little less, depending on what they do. Um, the other thing that happens is sometimes they're called pink beams. So a pink beam is a slightly bigger um, energy window. And I should say, when, when they say monochromated at a beam line, it kind of depends on which beam line you're at. Some of these are monochromated down to like electron volts. They will give you 10.213 kilovolts. You know, they plus or minus one electron volt. Others are monochromated plus or minus, you know, 10 to 100 electron volts or something. But 10 is pretty common. So they're, they're actually very monochromatic in terms of how the percent deviation. Um, and then you can take that percent deviation, widen it out again, and get a pink beam. The reason you do that really is to just get more photons. So now you have a broader spectrum, but you don't really care for your measurement enough, and it's fine to be pink. Uh, the white beam is basically just open the shutter and just let whatever comes out come out. Uh, so the white beams are great when you want intensity. They're terrible for a lot of experiments. They don't really, they don't really work for some things. Um, unlike neutrons, you don't get time of flight measurements because they're all traveling at the speed of light. So they all arrive, doesn't matter what energy you are, they all hit the detector at the same time. Um, so white beams can be really good for things like imaging. The same thing is if you, you know, if you, if you can't see something in your microscope, you turn up the light. Right, you just get more light that's on there, but it's all white light. It's just a bunch of spectra. Same thing is true with the white beam here. Um, one of the really powerful things that you get out of a synchrotron is this last one, is the, the ability to microfocus. And that's really what makes the synchrotron marry to the DAC, is the idea that I take all of these photons, 10 to the 8, 10 to the 12 photons that are coming out of something that's maybe, I don't know, a centimeter by a centimeter slit, and I microfocus those down to, let's say, 5 microns. So. Now I've got all of those photons that I can pinpoint right in the center of my DAC wherever I want. And this, is, this sort of effect is really what, what drives the synchrotron to be so, so well married to the DAC geometries. Um, so if you ever go to a synchrotron, and I think most user facilities are like this, you better have a night shot to prove that you were there and really working. So all user facilities, you've got to be there for 24 hours, otherwise you're slacking off. Um, so this is back in the old days when I actually did technically meaningful work. Um, and I happened to be, so I think this was in July, so this is probably 2 a.m. or something like that at the synchrotron. Um, and it's long enough ago that iPhone, picture, iPhone cameras were kind of grainy. Uh, this is taken at the advanced photon source. This is a picture of the advanced photon source. It's at Argonne National Laboratory. Uh, the the uh, circumference of the ring when you walk around inside is about a kilometer inside, so just to give you a sense of scale for this sort of thing. It's a very big facility. Um, are there bigger ones? Yes. Um, this, is the, this is kind of, I think, what, what the U.S. would call kind of our premier synchrotron. Uh, it's an 8 gigavolt electron uh, accelerator, or it's an 8 gigavolt ring of electrons that spin around, uh, and then because there are electrons, as they curl around, they're going to make photons and you stick some insertion devices inside of that to, to wiggle the electrons, and then the electrons will emit, um, emit x-rays, and that's how, you, that's how you get the x-rays out. So the, all the source is basically a beam of electrons zipping around a one, kiloma, a one, kiloma, a one kilometer ring. Um, the, the beam currently, well, currently it's down. It's being upgraded. It ran at 100 milliamps. When it gets upgraded, it'll run at 200 milliamps. So sort of the competitor rings in other places are Spring 8 in Japan or ESRF in, in Europe. And then there are a lot of other things. You may have seen some people that talked about the Diamond Light Source or ALS or um, NSLS2. Those are all great synchrotrons as well. Um, they generally, I think they're mo more like three gigavolt electron beams. So they, they have different, uh, different beam characteristics, but lots of stuff is still good there. There's also the Canadian Light Source. There is. Let's see. Even I learn stuff at school. I'll have to look it up for next time. Um, so, and uh, yeah, there's a nice one in Brazil. There's, lot, there's, there's, tons of, there's tons of them, and there's Soleil as well, I think, in France. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of synchrotrons, and what I'm, what I'm showing you here is a lot of the stuff at APS, but most of it is viable at almost any synchrotron a year. So, so if you are looking to do experiments and you can't get time at one place, it doesn't mean that that's not the only place. If you want to go to SNS, if you want to do neutrons, you're going to have to talk to Bianca, pretty much. That's where we do it in the U.S., but there's actually plenty around in North America. So, I've, so now we've got synchrotrons. I'm telling you they work with diamond cells, and I'll show you some of the fundamentals or, or some of the, the nuances in a minute. The question is, what can you do? 
And the real answer with a DAC is almost anything that you do normally. It's kind of amazing how many techniques have been kind of perfected outside of a DAC and then just moved into a DAC um, in, the, in the different beam lines. The very first things that were done with x-rays were diffraction. Uh, like I mentioned before, if you grow your crystal, you've got to do x-ray diffraction. It's just the community expects you to have a diffraction pattern with, with your sample. Same thing is true. A lot of the DAC work in the 80s used a lot of laser things, uh, Raman. So you have, you have these inferred structural phase transitions because of symmetries, but if you do something like Raman scattering, there's lots of positions in the, in the atomic structure that just aren't Raman active. They're, you, you're just not sensitive to them at all. But the x-rays, you're sensitive to all of them, provided you can scatter off of them. So hydrogen, not so much. And that's about it at the synchrotron these days. Um, and so, so there's a lot of these tools that, that people have, have pushed into the realm of DAC, and so that's what I want to talk about. Um, so if you don't see your favorite technique up here, or I don't talk about it, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist at all. It probably does exist. Um, so, like I said, the workhorse of, uh, of the synchrotron is probably x-ray diffraction. I, would, I haven't done any significant analysis, but I would bet that four out of five pressure papers is a diffraction paper something like that, or has diffraction in it at this point. Um, it's very rare to find a paper where someone discovers anything new at, anymore at below 100 GPA that doesn't have diffraction. So it really is a workhorse. The way it works typically at a beamline nowadays is that you come in with monochromatic x-rays, you go through one of your diamonds and you come out the other end on the back of the diamond. Your sample can be loaded with whatever you want. You could have a single crystal in here. You could have a powder. Um, I think Bianca kind of hinted to this. The worst thing you can have is the one that's in the middle, which is like, it's not a good crystal and it's not a good powder, but as you go to higher and higher pressures, that's what your answer is. Because your sample volume gets small and that's, you just only have N crystals in there and N is not 10 to the 20. And so, so you, you're in, you end up with a lot of things that become these kind of spotty patterns that, that she talked about before. Um, and there's a lot of work going into how to analyze that now, how to actually push your software to do that kind of multi-crystal scattering instead of powder diffraction or single crystal scattering. Um, this is a picture of what diffraction looks like in one of our DACs. You can, you can see we have rings, so this one we actually had good powder. Um, but you can see as you go out, there's kind of this rectangle. And so one of the things that we do with, with a lot of the things that we work on that are metals and we think are powders is because we want to go to high pressure, we don't keep a symmetric hole in the, in the backing plate that, that Adam showed this morning. We make a slot. And so that gives us more meat to hold the diamond. So our, our cells generally go to higher pressures than if we had, if we had just a, hole, a conical hole. Um, but we sacrifice having no data out here. So there's trades, choices, if you will. Or how you want to how you want to work your your experiment. Um, so in this case, because you're going through the diamond, your choice of gasket is really not terribly critical in terms of the experiment. It's just to make pressure. So if I were doing this, I would almost always use a rhenium gasket here because it's a very strong metal, and we know that it, it's going to allow us to go have a stable hole that goes up to high pressure. Um, and then. A lot of times, what we do at Livermore is we almost exclusively gas load ourselves because we can. Uh, we do do things where we use different oils or something like that. I generally don't like methanol, ethanol myself because it freezes very hard at, at 10 GPA. And so you all, everybody that does methanol, ethanol has a phase transition basically in their data somewhere. You, no matter what you measure, there's a little kink there at 10 GPA because the, the pressure medium just freezes so hard. And basically after that, it's no better than salt or something in terms of hydrostaticity. Uh, so we often use um, noble gases. The one of choice is neon for us. Um, helium is great. It's more, hydro, it's more hydrostatic for longer, but it has the problem of intercalating things. It was mentioned that over time you can intercalate the diamond, but if you can intercalate diamond, you can also potentially intercalate your sample with helium. So you can get some kind of weird, weird things where you kind of push helium into the sample depending on what it is. Neon's a little bit bigger. It usually doesn't have that problem. We use argon sometimes, and that's probably about it for the, for the noble gases. Uh, all of those freeze by 30 GPA, so everything, over the, everything above 30 GPA is frozen all the time, so at room temperature. Um, let's see. So again, I kind of mentioned this before, but the way that a lot of the newer, the newer diamond cells are being driven by these gas membranes, in fact, at, at, 
APS is sector 16. They have a double-sided membrane DAC, so you can kind of pressurize and depressurize if you want to and kind of walk it up and down. Uh, so that's been kind of a very fun thing. Uh, a really nice thing about it is it allows you to remotely pressurize it so you don't have to go into the hutch. The hutch at the synchrotron is basically a big enclosure, just like if you have a lab source, except it's a giant, it looks like a giant transportainer, like the back of a, a big rig truck. Um, and so you, you really, you can't go in there, you'll die. Uh, and so they keep you out of there. And so you don't really want to go in and out of the hutch a lot. So the, anything you can do to do things remotely from outside the hutch is good. When I first started doing measurements, in fact, what this one is, this is a pretty old, uh, an old experiment. I would say that we took sort of anywhere from 30 seconds to maybe five minutes for an exposure. Um, one of the last experiments I did, which was a long time ago, actually now at the beam line, I think I took an entire pressure run in about an hour. I set it to go remotely and I walked away and went lunch and just took the data while I was at lunch. Uh, every exposure was like a half a second. Uh, so just the way the focusing has gotten and how much flux you can get out of it and how good the monochromators are, uh, you can really burn through some diffraction patterns um, in terms of getting the data. It takes you much longer to analyze everything. Um, and that's a big challenge in the community as well as we go to these multi-crystal type diffraction setups. Oh, there's one other thing I wanted to mention, this very bottom one. Um, so oftentimes we talked about Ruby. So that's, that's a great pressure calibrant, especially if you're not doing diffraction. If you're doing diffraction, um, Adam kind of mentioned this a little bit, whether you have, I, in this I'm saying blue is sample and orange is my EOS standard. So let's say it's copper. Something I know doesn't have a phase transition, I know is not chemically active. I very much like to have that in the pattern. And the reason I like that in the pattern is because it tells me what the pressure is in the pattern, where the beam actually is. So in general, I would say the best thing is not to avoid having your, your, um, your calibrant in little pockets separately because you don't know about pressure gradients, things like that. So having it in the pattern is actually quite useful. You have to be careful about what you pick as a standard to make sure it doesn't overlap with your sample because then you can't necessarily measure it. So you need to do some planning of that, but it's very nice to have in there. So here's just an example of what you get out. You get that 2D diffraction pattern that I showed you on the previous slide, and then that gets integrated out as a muthily to give you what you would see as a conventional diffraction pattern. Uh, more and more people are starting at the synchrotron to start analyzing that 2D pattern. Instead of going through all of this integration, you're losing information by collapsing all those angles down to just a two theta. So you want a two theta and a phi, but I don't know how to do that, so that's, I'm gonna tell you how to do this. Uh, so once you collapse this down, there's some subtleties to that about how you integrate around the rings and how you mask that Adam talked about. But once you do that, the analysis is fairly straightforward and it's the same as you would do with a lab source. Um, one of the importances is, is calibrating this because we're, we are looking at something, this is probably done at about 25 kilovolts, that's generally where we do these things. If you're used to lab sources, you're out at 90 or 100 degrees typically with your diffraction patterns. Because we're at high energy, that scattering cone shrinks and narrows in, so everything happens down here, uh, more like in 25 two theta. So if you were on a lab source, like a copper source, you don't even get a diffraction peak until out here. Uh, and what that really drives you to is having very high resolution on your detectors and understanding your resolution and calibrating that resolution with something like cerium dioxide or some other standard at ambient pressure. Once you do that, you kind of know what your profiles look like, you understand your resolutions, and you can go through and do Rietveld refinement, Lebel refinement, whatever you'd like to do to pull out X-ray diffraction data. And you can pull out lattice parameters, volumes, et cetera. In this case, this is some work we did many years ago now on lanthanum bismuth, uh, looking at a volume, uh, volume collapse transition that's a kind of classic B1, B2 transition. So it's basically a salt to a salt kind of structure. And it matches really well with theory, which is maybe not surprising with something like lanthanum bismuth. But this is the type of data that you can pretty routinely get out. And nowadays, really, you could collect all of that data in a matter of hours or something take you much longer to prepare DAX and to analyze it, but that's what you'd get. Um, there's another technique that people use. Uh, they don't use it as much with crystalline metals, but for things that are amorphous, uh, you can't get diffraction off of them. So you can get some sort of scattering, but it doesn't necessarily tell you all the volumes. How you map the scattering of an amorphous thing back to a volume is a little trickier. Uh, so one of the techniques that's been developed is tomography. And so 
In this case, this is the first time we'll use a beryllium gasket. Uh, here's the diamonds and the beryllium gasket inside. You can't really tell just by looking at it. Um, beryllium gaskets are a bit trickier. It's way more brittle than kind of your conventional metals. It is a metal, it will deform, but it goes into kind of a, a, a it goes into brittle failure much sooner. So you don't get a whole lot of plastic deformation before it just cracks and splits open. So most of these beryllium gaskets actually in, in you know, the secret of that is that they get kind of pre-machined. So instead of taking a foil and pressing it down all the way, you kind of start it off slower by machining it into some sort of shape. So normally what we do in ours is they have kind of a conical shape inside of them so that they'll sit there and we can indent them. But we don't ask the same of a stainless steel gasket where we just put a foil in there and press it because it has 80% you know, ductility or something like that. Um, so in this case, the reason we use beryllium is because we're going to shoot x-rays through, through the side here. Um, beryllium is, you know, well, that's the nice part about a periodic table. It's up there, right? So if diamond doesn't absorb your x-rays, then beryllium won't because it's lower Z. Uh, and diamond's actually pretty high density. Uh, so, so beryllium, you know, it's not like it's just like, oh, it's a really low density material, um, but it's, it's a relative, it's basically a metal in terms of its crystal structure. It just doesn't have any electrons in the Fermi level. Uh, so beryllium doesn't scatter, it scatters very little. Um, so you come in here with 20 kilovolts and you'll never see the beryllium, it's basically invisible. And what you can do here is, I said that and then I'm going to point out the beryllium. Um, there's the gasket, there's the diamonds, you can see they're scattering kind of comparably, and then you have the hole in the middle that's your sample chamber, and in the center is a piece of tin in this case. And so you can basically take this image and then you can rotate your diamond around as many angles as you want, and now you're basically doing a 2D tomographic image of it, and you can reconstruct that. So you can take that and reconstruct the, the volume of, that you have in these dark pixels. You need some software to do that. We have a particular set of software that we use, but there are several different types of tools on the market that come, uh, come especially with now kind of tomographic setups you buy for the lab. And so basically you're measuring the attenuation as a function of pixel, in each one of them and reconstructing that into a volume. So here's an example of what it looks like at zero. Uh, there's a pressure marker underneath it. Uh, and you can see that as we go up to seven GPA, you can actually physically see that the volume of this thing is shrinking uh, as we put pressure on it. Uh, and then here's what you have for the data. Uh, one thing you'll notice is the error bars are very large. X-ray diffraction error bars will typically be down below a percent or so. And these are, these are clearly more like in the several percent kind of range. Um, and that's not surprising because you have to figure out, you know, just look at this picture. Where does it end? Is it the inside or the outside or, I don't know, make a choice and put an error bar on it. And so this is work that's done. You can see what the tin equation of state actually would be if you measured diffraction as the blue line. Uh, and yeah, the red line is definitely not as good as the blue line, but if you had an amorphous solid, so you had a glass of some sort or a bulk metallic glass or high entry alloy, I don't know what you've got, uh, this would be better than nothing. It would give you some idea. Um, the next one I want to mention is inelastic X-ray scattering. Um, Adam earlier talked about measurements that are hard, and he talked about transport. This measurement's kind of stupid hard. Um, you, have to, you, have a, you have to have a lot of stuff going on with your sample. You gotta make sure you have a single crystal. You gotta understand how your single crystal is oriented. You gotta put it in a DAC in an oriented way uh, so that you know, like let's say the C-axis is up. Now you also need to know which direction it's going kind of in the other planes. So you need some sort of diffraction measurement to kind of figure out the rotation inside the DAC. Um, the problem is that doing that at the beam line that you do inelastic scattering is actually doesn't work very well. So most of the time you have to build a DAC, go to some other beam line, kind of figure out how it's oriented enough that you can bring it to this, this particular beam line. Uh, this is the Helix. Again, it's at the APS sector 30, I think. Um, and this is a beam line that's basically specialized just to do inelastic X-ray scattering. So same kinds of information you're gonna get from inelastic neutron scattering, just in the X-ray regime. It's very good at doing phonons, thing, you know, so that's something that's coupling X-rays and neutrons are kind of coupling equally well. You can do magnetic measurements on this too. There's a version of this, sits next door um, at a different hutch called Murex, which basically does magnetic version. So in that case, the big difference is with neutrons, you're naturally coupling to the magnetism because the neutron has a spin. In the X-ray world, you have to resonantly 
tune your energy to the magnetic atom that you have. Fortunately, at a synchrotron, you can do that. Uh, so this one's a very hard measurement. You have to get time on a beam line. Uh, it takes like a week to get data or something. And so there's a good part and a bad part about a synchrotron. When it takes an hour, it's awesome because you can get a lot of data, but you have to kind of sit there the whole time. And you're, you, that's when you take pictures at night of the synchrotron because you're bored and you're sleep deprived. This one's actually pretty civil because it takes so long, you just set it up and let it count and go get some dinner. Uh, and you might get some dinner for three or four days before it's done. Um, so there, there's a ton of work that goes into how the Helix works. I guess I can mention briefly, you come in with a monochromatic X-ray. Uh, I think Helix generally runs right around 20 kilovolts. This is one of, the most, one of the most fancy monochrometers that's at the ring. It really has a plus or minus one electron volt or less on the monochrometer. Uh, and it has to because it's trying to measure millivolt excitations. So it's coming in with, with a 20.123 kilovolt X-ray and it's measuring a 20.123001 X-ray coming out the backside. So it's a 10 to the minus six kind of thing that it's measuring or 10 to the minus seven in terms of how it measures. Uh, but again, you can throw away a lot of X-rays at, at a synchrotron, throw away a lot of photons. Uh, so you put your sample in there and there's this very long analyzer that the, the and this is the same way, X-rays come in a diamond, come out the other diamond, the scattered X-rays go through an analyzer crystal and then get bounced over and so you get your, you get your energy dependent and your spatial dependent answer so you can find the inelastic component. The answers you get out of this, uh, you can see a couple of things. This is a measurement that was done on a uranium molybdenum alloy knot at pressure. Uh, and so you can see you can pull out a lot of the answers that you want for a phonon spectra. In this case, they, they agree very well with a theoretical model that we, that we had calculated. Um, and again, for things that are like high Z materials, they scatter very nicely. Um, you need to be thin enough that 20 kilovolts gets through it, but these are, these are doable things. Uh, this is an example of something we did God, was 10 years ago that we did this experiment, I guess, uh, on uranium ruthenium 2 silicon 2. So if you haven't heard of that, don't ever look it up and don't work on it. Um, but you can get some good, again, some good phonon measurements. And these were done at 2 GPA. And this was a very difficult, very time consuming measurement, uh, especially to get green and, you know, blue and everything to overlap. But it's a really powerful tool. It can be really useful if you're doing things, you're, under, you're finding weird phase transitions and you want to understand why there's a phase transition. You may come to the inelastic spectra and look for soft modes or something in the phonons to see if that's what's driving it. You know, is it an elastic thing or is it a magnetic thing? If you don't know, this is a great way of starting to ferret that out. Uh, another common tool that's used in all the x-ray world is spectroscopy. Um, in this case, this is a measurement of valence I wanted to talk about. This one's a little bit different. X-rays come in through the DAC and generally go out through the gasket. Um, and so again, this usually will have a beryllium gasket. You could also use kind of a plastic or a, you know, epoxy loaded gasket for this, depending on the pressure range that you want to look at. There's usually two types of, of spectroscopies that you end up here. One is one where you just basically have a detector out here and you kind of go to an edge. So let's say you want to look at lanthanum. You go to the lanthanum x-ray edge, you go and you sweep your incident energy above and below that edge. When you go above the edge, then it's going to start fluorescing. When you're below the edge, it's not. So you can tell, you can tell where the edge is here just by whether you get counts on the detector or not. Um, so that would just be sort of called partial fluorescence yield. Uh, the other way that you would do this is often by this one on the bottom, which sometimes was called Rixis. Uh, there's like 50 different types of Rixis. So if you look that up, you might find a bunch of different versions of that. It stands for resonant x-ray emission spectroscopy, but there's a lot of flavors of it. The one that, that I'm showing up here is usually now called HERFT, which is high energy resolution fluorescence detection, I think. Um, so all that really does is it, it replaces this detector again with an analyzer crystal. So what you can think about this is this incident x-ray is running from let's say five to eight kilovolts and every, at every one of those, you go to five kilovolts and then you sweep this analyzer crystal around to the detector and it allows you to pick up, let's say 4.2 to 4.8 kilovolts. So you're effectively getting an X-ray spectra at every incident energy and then you stack all those up if you want to. Uh, I don't think I have a plot of that. Oh, I will. Um, so this is what you would get out of the, the partial fluorescence yield. The first one I said, this is a single detector. For things like rare earths, this is great because the, you can tell the valence of the rare earth because the, 
the splitting between the three plus and the two plus is large. It's larger than the core hole lifetime broadening, so you can easily resolve the peaks and look and say, I've got samarium and it's 2.5. It's got some two plus and some three plus characteristics. Um, or euterbium like this. This is what you would get for more of the Herft or the Rixis spectra. These are particularly good for things that are more like transition metals or basically not rare earths, where you don't have the same kind of splitting and you want to try and resolve the peaks a little bit better. And so uh, this one I think is uranium antimony two that we're looking at in this case. And so rather than seeing two distinct peaks, you can kind of see kind of two hot spots as you, as you go through some of these things. Um, and so this is just a, a different way of doing kind of getting the same information from the measurements. It's a little more complicated. If you're a DAC person, it's no more difficult to make one DAC versus the other. It's just a matter of whether the beam line is set up for that kind of measurement. More and more beam lines are being set up with this kind of high energy resolution because they're there. And if you don't want the high energy resolution, if you want this setup to look like this one, you just fix the analyzer crystal somewhere and it goes right back to the old one. So more and more they're kind of setting up in this way. So you'll have access to that as you go forward. Um, I think this is my last example, and this is X-ray magnetic circular dichroism. The reason I wanted to bring this up is a lot of people look at magnetism, especially as magnetism and superconductivity compete, and they're both fun to look at. Um, and while neutrons are great at that, X-rays really don't couple to magnetism very well at all. There are some resonant magnetic diffraction techniques you can use, um, but this is sort of, this is probably the biggest workhorse that, that people use for this. And so the idea behind this one, this is an example of what you would get in iron. There's tons of XMC data on iron in the literature. The idea is that you come in with your, your X-rays and you're gonna excite, uh, you're excite one of these core levels up into the band somewhere. So you're kind of, you're resonant right with an edge, right at an edge. And the difference here is that if you have a magnetic structure, you have a spin split band. So you have a different spin up band and a spin down band. So depending on which one of these uh, which one of these uh, polarizations, either spin up or spin down, you're gonna excite into a different channel, basically, into a different band. So how do you select which one of these you touch? The way you select that is by polarizing the beam. So, um, so this is the same thing as polarized sunglasses, it's just done with x-rays. And how they do it is something called a phase plate, and that's as much as I know about a phase plate. I have no idea how it works, um, but it does. And so you can select your spin up, basically, and preferentially scatter into this. And then when you scatter into this area, you have unoccupied states. The, the number of unoccupied states is how big this white line is. So you can see I scatter here and I get this big white line. If I switch my polarity to go the other way on my incident photons, I'm gonna scatter preferentially here and I get this lower white line. So I get a difference between my X-ray absorption spectra with, with my polarity going in and that's called XMCD. So you basically take the difference of those and that's XMCD. Uh, if you do this at the magnetic edge, so let's say you, for iron, you need to do this at the 3D edge. The 3D electrons are the ones that are magnetic. So you have to couple to that. That's only at a couple hundred electron volts, right? The 3Ds are right up by the Fermi level. When you go to things like rare earths, this gets a little easier because the magnetic electron is the 4Fs and those are down in the core. And so that excitation becomes an L excitation. And so that, in this case, like an L2, uh, but, but it's down with, uh, down with the rare earths and that starts then coupling uh, better to the magnetism. Technically the 4F one is like an M edge or something like that. If you go to actinides, actually you can get to the M edge, which is the magnetic, uh, the magnetic ex excitation. So this one's a little tricky with a DAC too. Um, the reason it's tricky is because you have to go to all of these site-specific, these chemically specific X-ray edges. So if I'm doing this, I need to be able to excite the iron atom here. That's a very specific edge that I have to go to. In this case, it's an L2 or an L3 edge that I have to choose. Um, and so now I have to pick that energy. It's not a variable energy, and I need to get that through the DAX. So something like a rare earth, that might be at five kilovolts. And I told you that diamond stinks below six. It's very hard to do measurements down there. So the solution is basically just to drill a big hole through your diamond from the outside so that the diamond, instead of being three millimeters thick, is only about 100 microns thick in the center. So the challenge there, of course, is if you make this thing 100 microns and really wide, the diamond is just gonna fracture, it's gonna break. If you make it really, really narrow, you have to hit it, and you have to hope that your sample is in there too. So there's some, some choices and some trades you make here. 
The other challenge is you want about one scattering length or so of thickness of your sample, and so that tends to be like two microns or three microns or something like that. So I very deliberately showed a couple of atoms that are, you know, a couple of little powders that are sitting on the diamond here as opposed to them being piled everywhere. Um, you can easily make this DAC, get beautiful, get your x-rays aligned and everything, put it in there and find that you made a beam stop at the energy and you get nothing out of it. You've spent all this time making a DAC and making all this and you gotta take it apart and do it all over again. And these diamonds tend to break a lot easier because they have that, they, they're, these are called partially perforated. You can buy them, which is nice. Um, but because it's this thin area, the, the pressing it over and over tends to fail it. Um, so there's a few ways you can detect the x-rays that come out of here. Basically the point is you're gonna send an x-ray in and you're gonna collect the x-rays out. There is one called total electron yield that you can do, but you need basically a drain current in here. So this would be something where you've got x-rays in and electrons out. So you'd have to basically make a circuit with that. Um, so the kind of data that you get out of that is something like this. Um, this is the Zanes, it comes for free. So that's just the X-ray absorption spectra. And then this is what you would get for the XMCD signals. So this is particularly as a samarium 2 cobalt 17 permanent magnet that we looked at many years ago. And so the fact that you have this signal in the channel is telling that your samarium ions are magnetic uh, and that they are, they are ordered uh, in this case. And then you can also do the same thing on cobalt, which is really cool. So you've got the same sample in there and you can measure both of the different edges. So you can tell if, if you did have a sample and you didn't know if your rare earth ion was magnetic or your iron was magnetic, you can distinguish them with this. You could also see if one of them lost its magnetic channel. You know, like you pressurize it and the magnetism goes down or the magnetic order goes down. Do you still have both moments? Uh, you can ask that question and XMCD is a good way of looking at that. Um, so I think I'm out of time. I, yeah, I'm about 20 minutes over what I said I would target, so I'm sorry. Uh, but I'll leave it there for questions. Okay, questions? How do you know your capture? Oh, oh. Um, that's a good question. So for a lot of these, you, you're static in temperature. So like things like XMCD, we do those at four Kelvin. And so it takes a week to take the data, so you just got a thermocouple that's on the outside of the DAC, and you're just measuring that the whole time. Um, things like a lot of the EOS things, you can do those as a function of temperature. You can put it in a cryostat, you can put it in a furnace. Uh, generally, we just slap a thermocouple on the outside of the DAC. Um, for things like diffraction, the x-rays are at such a high energy, they don't really deposit, you don't really heat in that case, and diamonds are very good conductor, so you don't have to worry about things like that. XMCD, though, you can get low enough in energy that you have to worry about beam heating. Um, so some of those things where you're down in that six to 10 kilovolt range, you do have to be concerned. And it does become a real challenge whether you, how you measure that in situ. You know, if you don't believe your thermocouple because of transport dot, you know, modeling, yeah, it, com it comes very hard. It depends on how you make the sample. I mean, so what I would say is that those diamonds will go to the same pressure that you think a normal diamond will be. The trick is they, they're always more sensitive to all the things that break. So all the misalignments become more challenging. You know, whereas you might be okay with a, f a five micron misalignment for a 300 micron anvil, with those, you know, I would spend more time and get those lined up even more, like down to a micron or something. So I wouldn't say that it's a guaranteed failure, it's just a higher risk of failure. Uh, the other challenge with those is when you drill them, they're laser drilled, and it basically ablates everything, and so that hole in the center is black. So that's one of the other things, is you gotta line up your sample underneath the hole that is black that you can't see through, so. Um, I was curious, so you mentioned on the really, really hard inelastic static uh, measurements, but then wanting to have a, a well-oriented crystal, and let's say you do even know what way it should be oriented, do you have any good tips for then ensuring it stays in that spot, you know, I'm trying to, you know, epoxy or uh, stand it up on things or, or all sorts of things, do you, do you have any suggestions? Uh, yeah, my suggestion with that one is polish it so that the face that you want is on the diamond. 
I don't find that DAC samples move around a lot. They will, they'll basically fall to the diamond and they'll stick to the diamond surface just from static. And I don't ever find them to move around during experiments after that. But if you were to try and like, you know, put a little ruby ball under it to, you know, cock it up a little bit, uh, that's probably, that would make it really, 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 really hard kind of thing. So my suggestion definitely is if you have a larger crystal that you can at least orient, you know, one of the directions to polish it along that orientation, then cut that and put that in the DAC. And then inside the DAC, figure out your clocking, basically. Uh, is there a preference to using like a gold crystal or powder? For, this, for diffraction or for something else? <laughs> if you can get away with a powder, that's great. Um, it kind of depends on your measurement, what you want to look at. Um, you can also pick up things like charge density waves from, from X-ray diffraction. Uh, again, they scatter generally 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7 times lower than the diffraction signal, but if you took a diffraction signal in a second, and you have plenty of photons, you can do that. So that's something where you may want a single crystal because a powder might obscure that. You wouldn't be able to see it. It would just be somewhere else mixed in. Um, if you really know you just want structure, powder patterns are pretty easy to analyze. We have all the tools to do that. Adam kind of mentioned earlier, what happens when you have a phase transition and you don't know what it is? I usually just call a theorist and ask him to calculate a bunch of stuff that I can try. Because I agree with you, all of those, most of those softwares, with the exception of Jade, don't help on powder patterns. Uh, and that's a case where a single crystal pattern might actually help you distinguish some symmetries that you can see in plane that you can't see in a powder pattern. So it really depends on what you're going after. If you've never looked at anything before, it's the first time you're doing the measurement, if you can get a powder in there, it's probably going to give you more answers quicker. Final questions? Yeah. How long have you been doing high pressure work? So I started doing DAC work in grad school, so it was 20 years ago or something like that. I would say if you define work as actually doing DAC work, I probably haven't done DAC work for like five years or something like that. Probably haven't done any work in five years like that. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, and so, yeah, there, there's a steep learning curve. I, you know, I don't think anybody here is trying to pretend that it, there's not one. There, as Stan said, you're going to make cells and they're going to break. You, the, the, the hardest thing is to get over the hump that a diamond's a consumable. Like you're, you're going to break it, and you're not, it's not like you break it and glue it back together. Um, the, the last one I broke was at I think two and a half megabar. I broke both of them. There was nothing. There was nothing left in the cell. It was just powder. Uh, they just both of them exploded. Um, you know, so your best bet then is to like pick that up, sweep it, and sell it to a sell it and have someone make a diamond wheel for you or something. So. Which brings us to the most important question: What's the highest pressure? That's, <laughs> that's my highest, about two and a half megabar before it blew up. Um, at Livermore, I think our record right now is like five and a half or something with a toroidal a toroidal DAC. So. Okay. Yeah. Are you folks with the uh, shock? Are you, are you doing X-ray work? Are you, yeah. With the higher brilliance, I would think. No, they do. Uh, I didn't touch on that because this is DAC, but uh, there is there's a sector at a APS called the dynamic compression sector, uh, sector 35. Um, so it's near the near the main office building, and there they're combining gas gun shock shocks and laser driven shocks mm -hmm. with X-ray pulses. Um, mostly, what they've been doing is imaging. Uh, so you can image shock fronts, or you can image uh, ejected material, or something like that. Uh, but they have started; they have done some diffraction work. They've even done small angle X-ray scattering work as well um, during kind of like high explosive detonations to look at the uh, the detonation products that come come after the explosive, or or those that are in situ, like within the shock front of an explosion. So yeah, there's some pretty cool stuff there. It makes DAC work look cheap. Okay. All right. Thank Thanks. you. Okay. Let's congregate outside and here we go. You are always. You are busy with your